Hi, everyone. Welcome to the June edition of the Q&A webinar. Hope you uh, are all having a great week. Um, great month, great year. It's all good. Um, all right. So I've got a few people that registered for the, the webinar. I'm not seeing them arrived yet, but I do have um, a heart out today because I have another call uh, in a little while. So I need to go ahead and get to the questions that were submitted. Um, and feel free if you join in the middle to leave, um, put your question here on the um, chat box, or you can post it on the Facebook uh, page as well. And I will uh, snag that off of questions off of the, the Facebook page as well before the end of the session. And as you know, you can always uh, submit questions via Facebook, Twitter, email, um, or through the website. And you can get the details for when and where the Hangouts are um, on the website, morethanorganized.net. And I just realized, look at me, all organized. So organized, I forgot to do something. <laughs> ah, it's all good. We have, I just wanted to put the the actual thing where is it no I don't need to do that I need to do sorry bear with me I've got I have one already on here where is it there it is and I have this one too wait do I have this why are they not there? All right, we'll go with this one for today. Um, well, that's mysterious. I had a different one uploaded, and now it's not showing up here. Just love the way technology changes every time you use it. But in the meantime, here we are. And we'll go ahead and take that down. Now I'll answer questions, because everything's good. Hello, I have a viewer. Oh, they went away already. Oh, well. Um, these things happen. So I've got, I actually got some cool questions. Um, and for a change, a couple of them were from uh, someone that's interested in becoming an organizer. And so they're about how to help people get organized. So I thought those were kind of interesting. Um, and I thought I would share a little bit about that. Um, Cause I do have quite a few organizers that, that follow me and, and maybe watching, I don't know, hopefully. Um, so one of her fir first comments was, that embarrassment seems to be a huge hurdle when she's talking to people about helping them get organized and was wondering what the best way or ways to, to set um, or to approach it and, and set someone at ease about it being an embarrassing situation. Um, I'm wondering how many of you ever feel embarrassed by your own disorganization? Um, it's kind of funny. I was just, you know, I just had that little flub where I needed to put the, the banner there and um, it's not a big deal, but in my coaching circle, a lot of the people do podcasts or blogs or various video things, and then they feel like they need to spend a lot of time uh, doing editing and, and making it all perfect. And um, I made the comment that once you embarrass yourself a few times in public, uh, saying uh and so and um a, a lot doesn't seem like a big deal or seem like it needs to be uh What's the word? Uh, there's no real need to be embarrassed about it. It's just how things go. And so you can move on. And um, so it was interesting that this same question came in about how to help people over their embarrassment about being disorganized. And in my opinion, I'd love to take the shame out of it. You know, it's just a skill that we need to learn and habits that need to be developed. And sometimes osmosis isn't enough and you need to get the help. So I think it's much better that you're getting the help than worrying about being embarrassed by it. So I do everything I can to make it not shameful. It's just a thing. You aren't embarrassed when your car needs a service or you're, you hire a housekeeper. So why would you be embarrassed that you need to help, help getting organized? Um, of course, having said that, when we're talking to actual clients and people that are feeling a little bit of embarrassment, it's important to just reassure them a little bit. Um, you know, there's no magic bullet for uh, helping someone make it uh, better, but I just try to make it as normal as possible and reassure, reassure them. There's some soft language that can help. 
um, you know, we don't want to be um, too sharp in saying it, it, it is a mess. Uh, the reality is, yes, it is. But we, we know what to do and we know how to fix it. And so just by softening the language and reassuring that, that it's not an it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's, you know, I can figure out anything. I'm like Marie Forleo, everything's figure outable. So we, we want to just be nice and calm and, and make it seem like we've seen a mess like this too. We just knew how to figure it out. And so we're going to show them how to figure it out. And that's really true. I mean, when you move, everything's a mess. It doesn't matter how organized you are. There is a point where it's a mess. Um, or going into to certain situations where you're taking over a job from someone else, inheriting some stuff. There's always places where there's going to be a mess, and then you can figure that out. Um, you know, I, I like to look at it as, as the absurdity of life. What's happened that you ended up with this mess? What adventure occurred that, that created this? And how can we adventure our way right back out of it? So those are some fun ways to, to take a look at it. Um, and, you know, Sometimes people are embarrassed by a pile of something something and it's like well everyone has Dental floss not everyone has 57 things of dental floss, but everyone has dental floss So don't be embarrassed by the dental floss. It got away from you a little bit, but good news You'll never need dental floss again, you know saying those kinds of things can help make it not embarrassing But put that absurdity of life spin on it. Um, that's what I really like to do um Oh, one of the other examples I used was was air freshener, and it just happened again this morning at one of my clients' houses. There's a thing about air freshener. People like air freshener, and they buy so many things of air freshener, and um, we were cleaning something out, and there was a little bit of a, a smelly situation, and um, so she went and gra grabbed three bottles of air freshener and just put them nearby. <laughs> I'm sensitive to the, the chemical air fresheners and so she didn't spray them while I was there but she had them all ready to go right when I left and I'm like three of them isn't going to solve it any more than just using one will so um that's funny too it's all life is just funny we should be um enjoying the ride because everything we do is kind of absurd when you think about it um all right, so the other question, these are from a woman named Kate. This is the, the woman that's interested in being becoming an organizer and, and is just uh, starting with a couple people. Um, and then she wanted to know what the best way to assure someone that um, it's a good idea for them to participate in developing their own system. Um, and that's a question I get asked a lot. Um, I've always thought that having the input of my client makes the solution so much better. They are invested in the process. We've talked about how they think, and we've I've watched them actually move in relation to their steps so that then they may or may not um, be able to, to reach something, or it might be too heavy a place for that certain location that you were thinking of. Um, or it may be more natural for them to reach left instead of right. And knowing those things as you develop the system can make all the difference. Um, and so just there is a better, longer lasting result if the client is actually involved in the process. I'm happy to set it up for you, but you will have to be looking around a lot more for the stuff. Um, and, and it works in some cases, you know, last week I had a client that wanted her laundry room done and just wanted someone to go in and do the laundry room. We did the laundry room and it was all set up and she didn't need to have that much input in it. It really became um, just a standard laundry room and she could go in there and use it as a laundry room and it didn't, it, it didn't need to be personal. It's a laundry room. Um, some people like a pers more personal touch on their laundry room, but she did not. So that worked out fine. Um, sometimes setting up your actual desk requires you to be very involved. Setting up the file system, maybe not as much um, for the, the basic part of the filing system. Once we get into the interest files and, and how you work with files, yes, but there's a certain part of it that can be done without you and a certain part that you really should be involved to get the best result. Okay, so thanks, Katie, for those two questions about um, systems and how to overcome embarrassment. Um, let's see. I got a bunch of questions this time, so, and I'm just realizing that there's a weird glare on my glasses for you guys. Sorry about that. 
I don't know what's happening. Work on the lighting next month. Um, all right, so Andrea uh, sent me this via Facebook, I believe, last week. And she said that they do everything in the den. We have an elliptical machine, the TV, stuff for both of our businesses, books, notebooks, laptops, pens, and more. There's no room for a desk or a bookcase. We don't have a garage, and the house is 70 years old with little storage. So we have a storage unit, and the guest room also looks like a storage unit. What can we do? Um, this particular question, and, and I'm just going to click over and see if I see it real quick, because there's slightly more to this that just didn't print out on my thing for some reason. Oh, it's not going to be a quick find. It's far back. Um, so basically, her situation is what's happening with a lot of people. They move home to do work. They create a home office. They won't give up some of the room, auxiliary rooms that they have. Um, and it becomes multi-purpose rooms in many spots. So what I like to say is just because a guest room has always been a guest room doesn't mean it can't now be an office because your circumstances have changed. Guests can stay in a hotel. You can have an office because you're going to use your office a lot more often than you use a guest room. Does that make sense? Um, I have people that have guest rooms and they keep them pristine and nice and they have someone stay like once every three years. It's crazy. That's wasted space. Use it for the thing you do every day. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to... I want you all to experience the way I actually think, the way my brain thinks these problems through. And so I, I wrote uh, the answer back to um, Alyssa already, or I'm sorry, to Andrea already. And so I'm just going to read what I, what I said because it was such um, an interesting way she phrased things. And, and I used that humor that I was mentioning before about making things normal. Um, and helping people see a different way of viewing their room. So she has a den and it's full of everything they do. And then she has a guest room that's full of storage because she doesn't have a storage room. But if you just get rid of the stuff that's excess, you don't need a storage room, you don't need a guest room, you can have an office and you can have a den. So, um, and there were some things she said in, in her question that like they both work from home and, and didn't quite clarify everything. So. Um, I asked her in response, do you both work out of the house? Are the books currently on the bookcase or, and you just can't fit another bookcase or could a bookcase fit if you move the pile of books? This is another thing a lot of my clients have um, come up is they have a bookcase and it fills up and then they start piling books on the floor around it and you can't get to the bookcase to clear out the books to get to the new thing. and or they can't decide on a bookcase, and so they just pile the books up, and the books are on the floor where a bookcase could go, but there's so many books, they think a bookcase won't fit. But if you put a bookcase and then put the books onto the bookcase, everything would have a spot. So I wanted to point that out. Um, and then I wanted to point out that the, the age of your house and the lack of storage actually has nothing to do with organization. That has to do with your thinking everything needs to be contained in a specific spot um, that's already defined. And really, you can define whatever spot you want for pens, for books, for your office, for where you're going to keep your elliptical. You can choose. It, just because it's an extra bedroom in the bedroom hallway with a room and a closet doesn't mean it can't be an office. And it doesn't mean um, you can't have your office in the den and the TV in that guest room so that people can watch TV in the quiet and you can have more space to work and add a bookcase. So there's there's lots of ways of looking at where things can go and how you can use your spaces. Um, and I, I'm in New Mexico and um, I believe Andrea is too, but one of the things here is we don't have basements and we don't have attics. We have lots of single story houses um, many without garages, and the age of her house does probably mean that she doesn't have a, an attached garage. It's probably a, a separate single car garage if she has one at all. And um, 
sometimes when people move from other locations where there's lots of built-in storage automatically, they don't understand um, how to make it all fit in the new space. And really, it's just a matter of having less stuff. I'm sorry to say, you either need a bigger house or less stuff, and it's much easier to have less stuff. Um, and it's much easier to stay organized when you have less stuff. And so stop thinking of what, why can't I fit this in here? Instead, think what are the most important pieces that I have to store and get rid of the rest. Um, so that's how you set up a simplified living space where you can organize all and accommodate all of the activities you want to participate in, is knowing what's the minimum required thing. If you're a writer, do you need a laptop? Are you good to go? If you are uh, a writer, do you need a pad of paper and a pen? Would that work? Do you need 87 different notebooks and 27 different files of stuff? Or to be a writer, do you just need the way you write? Yeah, it's up to you. You get to decide that, but that's how you start thinking. Instead of, how can I keep everything? Think, what can I get away with getting rid of? Much easier. OK. Um, yeah, instead of trying to squeeze everything into the space, determine the bare minimum you need to do the task and remove everything else. Um, there's just more, more than one way of looking at things. So I love that question, Andrea. Thank you so much for submitting it. I hope you get to see the answer. Um, I know you already read it, but um, hopefully you get to see it as well. Um, then I had a question about how to eliminate the emotional ties to stuff when you're trying to get rid of clutter. Um, the attachment to stuff. And that's a hard one because we have emotions and, and emotions are not really controllable. For, uh, to a large extent, they are unconscious. They just happen. So what you can do is understand the relevance of that emotion to the stuff. And if a breakthrough can happen by ignoring that actual emotion and going forward with um, getting rid of something from a practical intelligent, into, not intelligent, intellectual place instead of the emotional place. And I'm not saying that you have to do that because there's a lot of things that I own that are purely emotional. I own a lot of art because it is beautiful to me and it makes me feel good and I, it's an emotional thing. Most of it is from friends um, and so there's that added thing, but I display it proudly and I treasure it. Uh, it's not in the closet gathering dust or um, broken in the garage waiting to be fixed or you know all those other things. It's, it's about actually what's important to you, not, and, and especially guilt emotions and bad feeling emotions, get rid of that stuff. There's no need to keep any of that stuff that makes you feel bad. Whether it's self-imposed guilt for not having done the thing you intended to do when you bought the item, or if it's uh, someone creepy gave it to you, or whatever that negative emotion, or it was a time in your life that was not great because you were drinking or drugging, or whatever it is, just know that you don't have to feel bad. Let those go, get those out first. The stuff that was fun and great, like this particular question was actually about a boat. She left her, or finally sold her boat, and they hadn't used it in five years, and so they sold it, but there was good memories attached to, to boating outings and, and those kinds of things. That can be harder. Um, but at the same time, to realize that we grow and evolve as people, and over the course of our lifetime, there are gonna be many activities that we once enjoyed and let go and no longer enjoy, and or have time or the bandwidth to do, and so it's okay to let that go. It was, it was a part of you, you have the memories, you can let the actual accoutrements that uh, made those memories go. It turns out we remember things differently every time we remember them anyway, so you're not getting a true representation of what happened. Um, the physical emotion is a truer reflection of what happened than the story you're telling around seeing the boat in the garage. Um, so I hope that helps. It's, it's just a matter of 
realizing that we grow and evolve and you don't need to keep the stuff to keep growing and evolving and having more new, better memories about whatever it is you're doing. Um, love that question too. It's just, it's hard, especially when it was fun memories. But you did it anyway and I'm really proud of you, Karen. Great job. Okay, so the other questions I have actually are kind of tied to the Minimalists documentary. Um, I don't know if you all know, but I run the uh, Minimalists local meetup for Albuquerque. And so we have the screening of Minimalism documentary about the important things screening a couple weeks ago. And a lot of questions have been coming in to me and to um, Josh and Ryan about minimalism and, and how um, various things are impacted. And some of the questions that came through on their podcast uh, this week were really interesting. And I thought I would give my spin on a couple of them um, as well. Uh, because I've been a uh, not, I'm not, not actually a minimalist. I've practiced voluntary simplicity, which means I consciously decide what I'm going to consume. Um, I put a lot of thought and effort into everything I purchase and bring into my life and everything I let go of um, and move on from or um, move towards something new because I like to grow and evolve and try new things. So there's it's a learning thing. Oh. Look at that. Do you see it right there? <laughs> that is a pile of CDs to burn. I haven't done that. I don't even have a CD drive on my computer anymore. So those are on their way out. I just ran across those the other day and I pulled them up there so I'd remember to take them and they are still sitting there. So it happens to me too, but those will go in the car later today and I will take them away. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you know you evaluate. I used to burn a lot of music. I no longer do that. I don't need the CDs anymore. Um, so one of the questions that came through though was what does it mean to live intentionally? And for me, it is knowing what I want and having the things I need to get that and realizing that that changes and that life is a rotating system our own lives and the lives of all the stuff that we own and touch and the people in our lives that come and go and the paper that runs out and you have to go buy more and the, um, you know, the gas you put in the car, everything is a rotating system. So you want to just, for me, living intentionally is having a plan to, to rotate the stuff. That's all it is for me to pay attention to how I'm interacting with my things and my environment to create an environment that I feel good in and um, reflects me and my values and my wants. And I take actions on getting things um, that I want. All right, so I see I have a couple viewers. Let me just see if I have any questions from said viewers. I'm very excited that some people are, are sticking with me today. I do find this. Is that you, Robert? Do you have any questions for me today? I saw you signed up. Did you have um, anything in particular I could answer for you? You can type it in the chat box. Um, or not, you don't have to. Um, thank you for showing up though. I hope you got something out of it. Um, all right, so in the meantime, let's see. Oh, look, here's another one. How do we minimize sentimental items? Exactly the same thing. Um, becoming aware of why it's sentimental to you. Why is it so touching? Um, I happen to have a couple things from my nephew he gave me that they're lovely, but they were picked out by a three-year-old. <laughs> um, and they don't necessarily match my decor and my... Um, lifestyle at this point in time. Um, and so uh, I'm kind of wondering if I should get rid of them yet. He's seven. Um, actually just turned eight. So I am thinking it might be okay for me to go ahead and get rid of those. Um, I love that he gave them to me. I love that he made one of them and I love that he picked one out because it made him think of me. Um, but they're not really my style. 
and that's okay. And I can get rid of those. So those are those I'm, I've been keeping for the last five years because of sentimental reasons. But now I'm ready to let them go. Like once you kind of work through why it's important for you to have that thing, what it is you're keeping it for, and then think through, well, what would happen if I didn't have it? Would I forget? Because again, I just mentioned, we don't remember the same way every time we see something that triggers the memory. The story of the event is different every single time we remember it. So keeping something to recall something isn't actually gonna help. You're either gonna remember or you're not, or you're gonna tell yourself a story about it, or you're not. But having the thing doesn't really help. Um, so it's up to you. I, I'm much more inclined to see if something sentimental is actually useful to you right now. Is it, you know, sometimes old love letters can be beautiful form of um, remembering or motivating yourself or keeping up your self-confidence um, by remembering that someone loves you. Um, sometimes, um, I'm trying to think what other sentimental things I have. Sometimes I have a card on my shelf from my brother that is a cat in a flower pot. It's totally silly. But he's a dog person and I'm a cat person, and so it was a very funny card, and the image is just really funny. Um, and so I, it makes me laugh every time I see it. I have um, a picture of myself as a child in the other room to help me remember to be um, childlike and joyful. So some sentimental things can still serve a purpose today and be relevant in your life now. Um, and those are okay, it's okay to keep that kind of thing. But something that's hidden away in a drawer, old photo albums, scrapbooks and things that you look at once every 10 years, why, why bother? You know, pull out the, the several most relevant pieces or look at them more regularly. Um, yeah, it's, Take photos of them, have them made into quilts, um, create a logbook, curate a spreadsheet, something. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be everything. I got rid of a lot of books by keeping a book journal. I have a very beautiful leather-bound journal that I write down in it every book I've read and who wrote it and when I read it. That's it. It has the date, the book title, and the author, and then I let the book go. It's a weird running record that I've curated for myself for the last 30 years, and I'm still in the same journal. And so I have one book instead of thousands. I do have about 100 books. Um, but it, it, it's a way of, of keeping a portion of it, a part of it. Um, if you keep a calendar or, or a journal, that can be a way of letting go of a lot of the other things as well. Well, we're about at the end of the time. I didn't get any actual questions through. We'll have to work on that. Oh, oh, it was Katie watching on her husband's account. Good, I'm glad you got, I hope you got to see your stuff. Um, your answers, they were at the beginning. Um, I went ahead and read them and, and gave a little, slightly different spin than the, what I wrote. Um, all right, well, thank you for showing up, Katie. And um, everyone else that watches later, thank you. I hope it worked. Uh, it answered some things for you and feel free to send me questions at any time and sign up again um, I believe I'm gonna have to time shift the July webinar I like to do them on the second um, Thursdays but I think I'm gonna have to push it to the third because of a conflict um, but look for the new registration uh, on the website more than organized net and thank you all for sharing your questions and I hope the answers were helpful and I will talk to you again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.